All right, everybody, don't drop that fast forward button. The sponsorship roll call is about to begin. Energy Consulting Limited provides complete project management and general contracting services to a variety of private sector clients on both commercial and residential construction projects. They act as the owner's representatives through the planning, design, budgeting, scheduling, construction, and occupancy processes. Clients appreciate their open, honest, and flexible approach to achieving their project goals. Although they're located in Surrey, BC, Energy works on projects all over the province, including the growing cities of the north and the beautiful coastal towns of Vancouver Island. They're always excited to explore new places and develop relationships with professionals wherever their clients' interests may be. Abacus North is a firm that specializes in mortgage banking solutions for complex projects. In addition to providing financing solutions in a traditional mortgage broker capacity, Abacus North provides direct loans that range from $2 million to $25 million. On a syndicated basis, they provide mortgage banking solutions up to $300 million. In most cases, their in-house capital solutions can bridge financing gaps that traditional lenders are unable to service. They specialize in providing land acquisition loans, construction financing for large-scale developments, income-producing properties, and single-purpose facilities. With a portfolio that includes high-rise, mid-rise, and low-rise condominiums, townhouse developments, shopping centers, agricultural properties, industrial developments, and medical marijuana facilities, Abacus North is at the forefront of creative mortgage banking solutions with a focus on fostering long-term relationships. They are a multifaceted organization that services domestic and international clients with their mortgage banking needs. Complex financing solutions require analytical thinking well beyond a typical mortgage broker relationship. As a result, they focus on providing engineered solutions for their client. Their key differentiation strategy is that they assist clients in actively managing the capital stack in order to minimize borrowing costs while maximizing flexibility. Abacus North focuses on national and global opportunities. Ascentia CPA has a team of new-gen chartered professional accountants that are dedicated to advancing companies using expertise combined with emerging technologies. The team at Ascentia will implement the latest accounting technologies, allowing you to not only run a business, but to run a smart business that will excel in your industry. Their focus is to provide growth-centric, value-added, and timely accounting services for businesses as well as individuals across Canada. Unlike standard accounting firms, by embracing cloud-based software, the team at Ascentia will provide you with real-time accounting information on a secure platform that is accessible anywhere at any time, allowing you to make better informed decisions and gain more controlled overview of your financial data. The reliability and expertise you'll experience with the professionals at Ascentia will assist you in the preparation of corporate and personal tax returns, financial statements, bookkeeping, government filings, tax and estate planning, as well as business advisory services. For more information on the advantages of online accounting and to book a complimentary meeting online, be sure to visit ascentiacpa.ca. We are... All right, Veronica, we're on, we're back, and uh, we didn't meet up last week, and I didn't post anything um, this week or for about the last 10 days, you know, about like my journey with this, you know, plant-based vegan diet or anything, because I knew we were coming up to this episode, and I really kind of wanted to get into the weeds with you um, about it, and to be like, you know, completely honest, I wasn't feeling as many like kind of adverse side effects as what I did. Um, when I was on the carnivore diet now, like that doesn't mean that the carnivore diet was, you know, like bad. I just mean as in like, like I could tell, like, I just felt differently. Like there's just like different things that I could feel. And I didn't feel those same things when I was on the vegan and plant uh, based diet. I feel like the detrimental effects were things that you would never feel. And that actually kind of scares me a little bit more because those become like, like the sleeper things that could actually come up and bite you in the butt and you're completely unaware of it thinking like I actually feel really healthy but I have underlying health concerns that I'm manifesting and I don't actually realize it 
Um, that was the nice thing about the, the carnivore diet is any underlying health concerns that I may have been like accumulating. I was actually going through physical symptoms of that, which is more of a red flag, which I actually feel is to people's benefit. Um, you know, and I've got into a lot of really heated conversations lately um, with people what I now feel like are very close minded in like the nutritional realm and, you know, like nutrition landscape, because we're so indoctrinated with having like this certain perspective of how we perceive diets and how we perceive nutrition and the documentaries that are very public right now and the ones that come out. Um, you know, so the one thing that I just want to say to you really quick right now is like, I, I really have started to value and appreciate how open-minded you are when it comes to diet and nutrition. Oh, yes, because I don't stick with one thing. Also, like a diet itself, like a, everyone actually responds a different way. So uh, for me, I, I really want to understand that right now. You, 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 today's the last day. Uh, yesterday was. Oh, yesterday was the last day. Yeah. And then tell me because I'm so curious. What's your next move? But today, so what did you start? What uh, diet? Ketogenic diet today. Yeah. Oh, right on. All right. So let's, let's go over a ketogenic diet a little bit. I'm very curious. Uh, so what is your plan? Are you going to do like a standard ketogenic diet or are you going to do like uh, uh, those uh, targeted ketogenic diet or cycling ketogenic diet? Which one do you go in? Um, I think what, if anything, like what I'm going to do is just kind of like really like trying to hone in back on to kind of like what I was doing like originally kind of like because a ketogenic diet is a lot more to like what my regular diet normally is on a on a day-to-day -day. um you know kind of getting back into like intermittent fasting because like that's that's you know like where I actually feel my best and you know I feel like my body functions the best you know is when I'm intermittent fasting you know on a little bit more of a ketogenic diet um you know like I want to try to keep you know my ketone levels you know maybe around like you know, 3.0 to 4, depending on your advice, you know, like I'll, I'll lean on you or what you actually think an appropriate level, you know, mm -hmm. is for like my ketone levels there. Um, I got a little breath test ketone monitor. I bought one of the best ones that, you know, that I had access to um, just so that it produced the most like accurate results. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like I wanted to get out of just like the P test strips, you know, I wanted to, you know, do something, you know, like with like with the breast test or breath test. Um, but I didn't want to always have anybody doing like the pinpricks, which I might end up doing because I think I want to test my blood sugar levels this month too, just to see what those fluctuations um, are like. Because the one thing I've realized by doing the carnivore diet and by doing the, the vegan diet is that I find both of those diets extremely, extremely hard um, to incorporate intermittent fasting um, because like the blood sugar level instability you know, because like with the carnivore diet, obviously you're going through glycogenesis, you know, pretty heavily, you know, converting a lot of that protein into carbohydrate, you know, and then being vegan, you're pretty much only really eating carbohydrates for the most part, you know, so like you're, you're very glucose dependent on, you know, vegan diet and, you know, like semi glucose dependent on a carnivore diet, you know, but like this just allows that a little bit more of a homeostasis because when, when we talk about a ketogenic diet, especially like intermittent fasting, like it needs to be sustainable and how does that come become sustainable? You know, and the one thing that I know, like I tried really hard to intermittent fast while I was on a vegan diet. And I think it's, it's actually like next to impossible. Um, just because like your blood sugar levels are so unstable because of your massive amount of like carbohydrate intake, like you just, you get like those, like those hunger pains and you know, like the unregulated blood sugar levels, you're kind of going through those ups and downs, the peaks and valleys and stuff. Um, so like, you know, when it comes to like the keto jag diet, like I just really want to focus on you know, getting back into intermittent fasting, you know, getting into having, you know, predominantly like a, like a fat based meal before bed and maintaining like a, a 3.0 to 4.0 uh, ketone level. Um, like, and, and like I said, unless if you suggest otherwise. Yeah, that's a nutritional ketosis. That's actually optimum. Yeah. Um, the range you can get it, but I mean, like, uh, so if you do intermittent fasting, like uh, what's your uh, fasting window? Um, I've actually... I'm going to throw something out there that might be like a little bit controversial, but again, it's just because I know my own body so well. I know I actually think that intermittent fasting windows are, are irrelevant. Um, I think the relevancy behind the intermittent fasting is just going a prolonged period of time fasting and having a smaller eating window. I, I now believe for myself, first and foremost, that 
doing like a, an 18 and six or 16 and eight. Like I, I don't find there to be relevance in those windows. Um, because again, does my body really know the difference between like a 17 and what seven, mm-hmm. no window? Like, like why is that any different? Like I, I just know again, for me, that's not relevant. I just know I need to go about two thirds of my day without eating and about a third of my day eating. And I think that that's kind of like the more relevant way to be able to look at it instead of like rigid time windows is that you just need about two thirds of a 24 hour window not eating and a third of a 24 hour window eating. So that's around roughly how many hours then you're eating? Um, Well, it would be, it would equate to generally about a 16 and eight. Now, I say that as a general because like sometimes it might be like a 15 and nine and you know, sometimes it might be a 20 and four, but again, I think intermittent fasting really just comes by way of going the majority of your day without eating and the the minor part of your day eating. And I think it's like, just kind of like the global concept. I find that what actually has substance to it and what I know from over like the months and years, that seems to be the relevancy behind it. Yeah, I agree. But then again, when you do intermittent fasting, usually people give that window because uh, you have to be sustained or certain your uh, meal time. So let's say some people like to start from morning early eating and then they cut earlier. And some people, they're not a uh, morning person just to say, you know, they don't like to eat breakfast. You know, they start from like uh, early afternoon or they start at, like uh, noon. Some people say 11 uh, a.m. So what category are you? Are you like like a morning and they're cutting early or are you at the person that afternoon and then you cut? Even I, would, I would say if anything, like I kind of work my way into that, like, you know, probably like by, by default and by no other way um, between like 11, 11 and 1 is when I'll usually typically start eating, mm-hmm. you know, and then I'll eat from that point on, um, you know, and like I only – only because like when you're in ketosis, I actually really thought that, you know, eating before working out was crucial. But I think when you're glucose dependent, it is. Uh, but when you're ketone dependent, I now know like, like it's not like I can definitely push through my workouts and stuff like that. Um, also too, depending on the type of workout um, that you're doing, you know, and like, just like a lot of factors that come into play, you know, like, have you worked out that day? Are you not going to work out that day? Like some people follow a very, like, I know some of my clients, they're on, like, they'll work out Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. So they always have midweek off and then the weekend off. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, like that Wednesday eating window is going to look a little bit differently than, you know, the Friday, you know, Mm -hmm. um, eating window. And then the eating window on Monday is going to look a little bit different than the Saturday and Sunday. Like, Mm -hmm. that's where I think, like, there's, there's like that variability, but I think there needs to be the rigid timeframes just to give people a guideline to follow. But once you've done that, I think that you, you can change that system around to be able to kind of um, play that on a day to day basis in a little bit more efficiency. So like on a day where I wouldn't work out, I would try to push that window longer. You know, like that might be a day where you go 20 hours of fasting and four hours of eating because your caloric demand is lower. Uh Like on a, on a Tuesday, if you work out Monday, Tuesday, and then Thursday, Friday. So if you were on a Tuesday and a Friday, well, your eating window might be sooner because now you're at the back end of your double day of your workouts. Mm-hmm. You know, so like, like that's where like, I think like once you know enough about it, you can kind of play around with like that variability and still achieve the same success because, you know, your, your fasting state is going to be different on a, on a low caloric demand day than it is on a higher caloric demand day because you're going to mimic fasting in a little bit different of a way in your body if you're working out that day versus if you're not, you know? So like, it is like, I have found these things, but again, we're also talking about not the general public and somebody who knows happens to know way too much about their body. Exactly. Because uh, I'm giving those a schedule for my client 
Yeah. When I give like, you know, when I'm fasting or, you know, when I lay out their workout schedule because it also depends, but mostly depends on, you're right, it's like it depends on the type of workout, you know, if you do high intensity interval training or you just like doing like standard, you know, regular training that, you know, you don't play a lot with your heart rate. And some people like just a sanitary, but they just want to go through like intermittent fasting. And so they, from there, it's like all different, but the regular people, they don't know. What to do so they need a guideline and then <clears throat> myself i tried everything i did a cycling too i did uh a targeted ketogenic which is like i always have a start right before i work out which is i don't need big meal but like i have like right amount of uh, uh, try to get some uh, polyphenol in my body you know i go for the phytonutrient with some fat as well and then i uh train and then right after that you know i eat again and then i cut early my food you know i did that as well and then sometimes i go like a prolonged time just like a standard ketogenic diet which is like just like you know really really minimum and my body is really sensitive yeah. like dominic go over like a 15 percent of a carbohydrate it doesn't matter it coming from fruits or even vegetable or just a regular uh, starch carbohydrate i just get kicked out of a ketosis yeah. so i have to be really low almost nothing then i get into the ketosis and then from there i just refeed myself yeah yeah, even with feeding day, like I have to manipulate a lot to body to actually adapt to that. It took me for me about like a four and a half weeks to adapt to that. So everybody's different. Maybe yourself, you already know your body, so you can get into ketosis maybe within three days, two days. If you um, actually, fasting, even already, you get into. I actually have it refined down to a day and a half. And I have, see? A, really, I have a really wicked system of like how like I can do that. So, um, Say, for example, on like a Friday night, if I have a really like, no matter how I eat or what I did all of Friday is irrelevant. Before I go to bed, if I eat like, like a, like a ton of fat, like, you know, very certain kinds of like healthy fat, mm-hmm. go to bed, wake up in the in, uh, three quarters of the next day fast Mm -hmm. and do you know like a cardiovascular activity that's a little bit more steady state heart rate cardio something that is you know going to be in a lot more of like a fat burning state um and i run that you know maybe about 60 to 90 minutes you know somewhere around in that range and then i eat fat for the entire rest of the day Mm -hmm. i can wake up the next day and i'll be at like a anywhere between like a four to five i have to peel it back like I can get myself up to like almost like uh, ketoacidosis within two days if I'm not careful. Right. And then uh, also depends on what time you cut your food at night. Also, it affects your next day, right? So, yeah, but that's what I said, you know, a couple yeah, of weeks yeah. ago, like with this, like I can eat like 600 grams of fat before bed and wake up the next morning, like in ketosis and stuff, you know, just like, like, again, like this is just my body and, you know, I might just be that anomaly, well, I know I'm one of the anomalies. I could even get away with that and stuff. Mm-hmm. But it's just like, I, again, like I just happen to know like too much of, about my body. And I agree, like, you know, most people take, you know, at least like, you know, two, three days to be able to get in into yeah. get, like, you know, if they're trying really hard. But again, the one thing that I, I relate to that is because it doesn't matter how I eat, like the day I decide to want to be into ketosis the next day. The one thing I've really understood, like a, the two absolute key factors of like getting into ketosis extremely easily um, is just exercise and fasting. Yeah, the, all fasting is necessary is number one. And of course, the exercise as well also is increase your insulin sensitivity as well. But the thing is that people also before they say, why I can't get into ketosis? They like, they frustrated. Like, you know, it's been four weeks. I'm not getting into ketosis. I tell them, listen. Before go there, you have to fix your metabolism first. Yeah. Yeah. And then like they already, hormone is like out of whack. Like let's say like their stress hormone is is not balanced. So their circadian is not really in the right pattern. Then you know what? No matter what, if you want to get into ketosis because you cannot uh, manipulate your uh, cortisol level, then it's going to increase your blood sugar level. So then like there's no way you're going to get into ketosis. So people, they don't know, they have to fix you know, inside the force and then get into ketosis. But yourself, even though you did a carnivore diet and you jumped to a plant-based diet, now you're getting into a ketogenic diet. But you hitting really everything like exercise, you're doing like a getting into cold tank and then you do like outdoor exercise and then you do, do you do meditation too? 
Uh, yeah, like meditation, sauna, hot tub, cold bath, um, high explosive um, cardiovascular activity, steady state, you know, heart rate activity, long endurance, short endurance, you know, strength based, functional, you know, like I, I really truly do it all, you know, like, or, you know, just like a lot of like self care, rolling, stretching, um, you know, like, like meditation, like I, I've actually really realized the number one time that I prefer to meditate is after an extremely strenuous 30 to 40 minute functional workout. Oh, really? Because like, after you're done that 30 to 40 minute, like it, because 30 to 40 minutes to me, like you, you can't do an extremely high functioning functional workout for longer than 30 to 40 minutes. Like, like, because you, your performance starts to go down. Like I'm talking like 30 to 40 minutes of like, you're rocking every part of your body in every kind of capacity. And you've just started to kind of crash a little bit. And I, I just know, and I see people like lie to themselves. I used to lie to myself all the time. You want to push through and you're digging, but I mean like when you're still operating at optimal performance, about that three, four minutes. So then when you stop, like you're, you're emotionally balanced because like, like everything's just kind of been taken away from you. Your heart's pounding. You're emotionally clear, you know, like you're physically just done. Like you just, you want to be vulnerable. Like it's a really vulnerable state, you know, like I'll lay there with like some of my buddies who are like the definition of like a dude, you know, this man, I got this truck and this cigar and this hairy leg. <laughs> and like, we'll sit there and like, like you could just, you could hug it out and meditate. You know, like you're just like, you are in an extremely vulnerable state if you just allow yourself to be able to be there. So I actually found it cuts down on a lot of the, I need to be able to get to my happy place while I'm meditating. It, it puts you so much more in that peaceful, tranquil, vulnerable state without having to really work for it or condition yourself to get there because by default you are, you just kind of need to tap into an, an environment that already exists. It's like, if you are thirsty, you don't have to go look for water. If there's a water fountain right beside you, you can just drink, mm -hmm. but there is other water sources to be able to quench your thirst, but there's a water source right beside you. you might as well just drink out of it. So like I find when I do that and I immediately go into like a, a meditation, um, like I just, I get to a state in my meditation that typically will take me about 15 or 20 minutes to be able to get to, if I just decide to sit down and allocate this specific time to meditating. Oh, to get into that flow state that it takes 15 minutes to get into. Yeah. But people have all different type of medi uh, meditation. Yeah. What kind of meditation do you do? Um, I primarily focus on um, necessity meditation. I, and I actually, there might be a proper definition for it. Um, there might be some guru who labels this to be theirs. I'm not saying it's mine. I just think it's something that like I've come to. So I guess I'll just talk about it. So with meditation, the one thing that I realized is that um, there's a lot of stuff going on in our minds and meditation is, is a way to be able to tap in, to be able to like kind of clear that out and, you know, like reconnect with your, with yourself and, you know, kind of get to the point that's past all the noise. But the one thing that I realized about like researching meditation, I was just like, well, it's not all really noise that we should be getting past because the the one part that i always kind of realize that there's layers to the noise there's a hundred things that are going on in my day i think they're all relevant because they affect me but they're actually not so about 50 of them might actually kind of be relatively relevant but out of that 50 there's probably like one or two that are actually relevant but because i have all this chatter still I don't actually really know and I can't identify which one of those 50 things or which like two or three of those 50 things that like I really need to focus on. But there, I always notice that, that as I'm meditating, my mind keeps coming back to wanting to think about something, you know, and it's just like, no, I need to come back to my breathing, come back with inside myself, close that door. I don't want to be thinking about those emails. You know, I want to be thinking about that text message. I want to be thinking about that podcast. <sighs> Inhale, exhale, come back to myself. But then I thought, I'm like, what if I do the opposite? 
what if I spend all that time to get past all the chatter to find out what, what those one or two things are that are extremely relevant to my subconscious? And then I investigate that. Well, it's not all my emails, but which one of those emails is my subconscious manifesting as I need to be dealt with, an action item for me personally. So then I found my mind, I can sift through it. Oh, that one, or like there's this going on, or like that text message, or like I'd be thinking about like like a podcast coming up. You know, it's just like, well, what do I really want to talk about with this person? Like, like why do I even want to do this? So I would investigate what my subconscious was was speaking to me and telling me. Then once I I understood that, and I actually just instead of trying to suppress it and focus back on my breathing and come back to me, when I when I went the opposite route and saying, I want to investigate this. I want to take this time to find out what one of those one or two things are that are actually really important to me. And then I fully investigate and, you know, dive deep into understanding them. And then meditation occurs after that. I'm at a place of homeostasis because now my subconscious is clear. I'm not trying to suppress all this stuff going on in my day to be able to find clarity. I've actually now achieved clarity. Because I'm not thinking about the emails anymore. Because again, it's not about the 100 emails that I have. There's probably only one email in those emails that's actually relevant that's causing me distress. And it might even have been an email that happened like two weeks ago. It might not even be an email that's sitting in my inbox I haven't opened yet that I know is there, just have, but like it might be something else. You know, so like once I've done that and I've, I've actually wanted to use it as a tool to be able to find out what my subconscious and my intuition is saying like, Hey Blake, like wake up here. Like this is important. You know, like this is weighing on us. This is taking energy away from, from us. Like you, you won't recognize that like how important it is for me, like my intuition, like my, you know, my inside, like my energy, my subconscious saying like, like, let's actually just like find out what it is like that. Like that's the style of meditation. And like I said, it might actually be a style. I don't know what, if it is, but I actually found doing that. I am a, at a way, way more tranquil place during my meditation, not only when I'm focusing on those things, but then after I've realized what the importance is about those things, then the best part is I go do those things after my meditation. And then I feel really good. That's the one way of meditation because you are really focusing on one thing. So you are getting in that flow state. Mm-hmm. I give you the simple example. In the past, when I create lots of deck, you know, presentation yeah. deck, I'm in flow. Like I'm looking for the picture image and you know, what kind of words I'm going to write. I'm really get in there. I don't know. Like if there's out, you know, somebody shooting gun, I don't know. I just be in there. And then I thought that maybe I stay for an hour and then I look my watch and oh my God, it passed three hours. Yeah. That's the meditation. You yeah. get in that flow state. Yeah. So if there's so many different types of meditation, what works for you? And then I do a lot. I do mantra as well. I do breathing uh, meditation. I do guided meditation. Someday I do the visualization. I just visualize. I just sit down. I just thinking, I close my eyes. I think, you know, the place that where I really want to go. And then I visualize and I feel like I'm there. Yeah. And then I'm like, I get for a second. My heart is like, wow, I'm so happy. I'm opening. I always visualize one thing. There's nobody there. It's right in front of beach. And then I can hear the ocean's wave. Yeah. And I'm wearing white dress. Mm-hmm. And with my hair, is just let it, you know, go, not ponytail. And I'm bare feet. I'm walking. And I breathe. It's coming to my face. That's my visualization. I really feel it. And from there, like, I think about, okay, when I walk up there, I'm going to have my house. And I start to visualize my dream house. Yeah. And then uh, I get in there, you know, when I make it in the kitchen, I have one short espresso. So I just walk through what I'm doing there. And then I open my eyes the end. It already passed like 45 minutes. Yeah. That's like a, that's a visualization. So there's a many different type of uh, uh, meditation. So one way you're doing it, that's meditation. Some of the um, entrepreneur, I know my friend is very successful and he does meditation more than an hour in the morning. And then his meditation is he just get up 
and he does like what he has to do. He visualizes all day from task one to task 10, even the who he has to meet, what he's going to talk about. And that's his meditation. Yeah. And then when he actually opens his eyes and he feels good and he's confident and he executes. Yeah. So he's already in there before he really physically he does a step. Mm-hmm. So that's meditation too. So that's good. Wow. So you do meditation. And yeah, in in, I actually really like that you brought up that point because this is what I try to say to people when they ask me about like meditation and if I meditate and all these things, like now they like, kind of like what we're discussing is that I was the same way about two years ago that I think where a lot of people were, are, and still are going to be until they, more conversations like this happen is that mm-hmm. meditation is not lotus pose on the top of a mountain by a Buddhist monk. No. And for like decades, that's what I thought because there was nobody ever really talking about like meditation can simply just be like, like rolling out your body and feeling the trigger points and trying to get that one spot out. Like meditation to me now just means really just taking the time out for yourself to prioritize yourself, no matter what that may be. Like a form of meditation can be going and having authentic undistracted time with a friend or a family member or you know taking a nice long shower and just focusing on that hot water or that cold water just how it feels on your skin and being in tune with that like like meditation can be so many different like ways and like options to be able to get there but again like it just comes back on to like respecting and understanding and taking that time out for yourself Absolutely. And that's why two things. Meditation is a focus, awareness. If yeah. you have that, and that's your meditation. So for me, like, uh, I don't force like, how many hours I'm going to do meditate. Yeah. I just go in the flow. Yeah. And then I know when I can just open my eyes. When I'm done, I know. So yeah. that's what I do. So meditation is uh, more, it's the like, same thing as any other, like, like exercise. Yeah. You practice more you get better, you tap into that state, you know, where you want to be. So that's real meditation. And I tell you one thing, when I use my meditation app, yeah. sometimes I go to guided meditation. And the minute, it's, everybody's different, but when the meditation instructors start to talk about, close your eyes, and then you know what? I just change. Yeah. Because real meditation instructor, they don't change their voice. It's a natural, just normal voice, like I'm talking to you. Mm-hmm. that's a real like that's a real meditation instructor start to talk about change voice like okay Blake yeah. you are going to sit down I'm like okay you're done with me <laughs> yeah, and the, but, so then like what I identify that with is that that's how you know if it's real or not that's how you know if that person is there you know like that's like you know somebody who's going to be like okay let's lift some weights and then they go deadlift like 400 pounds like that guy's strong but you just, you know that, but you know, and like you said, with like somebody who's guiding through a meditation, like you can tell when it's an authentic um, part of where they're coming from as like a human being, they're coming from that place and that space of tranquility, because that's where they are at in life. And they exude that energy and that presence with everybody else. That's right. So meditation is really important. Really people either they want to lose weight, they want to be actually just to create a good health. Mm-hmm. Anything, meditation, especially you on to ketogenic diet, very important. Yeah. That's only one thing actually can play with your stress hormone. Yeah. So that's important. I, you know what? I don't have to talk to you. So you know everything about those things. So like, <laughs> I want to the other guinea pig. Somebody actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so this Rookies. Is actually, yeah, I'm actually going to like segue this into like kind of like this, this carnivore vegan, um, um, like these two months and like what I've learned because the, 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 where this segue exists is that I actually really thought I was knowledgeable about what I knew until two months ago when this mm. actually started. So a few of the things I want to kind of just like to, to talk to you about right now to kind of let your, your wheel start turning is that, okay, so like on the carnivore diet, like I obviously felt like I had strength or I, I felt like I didn't have strength. But when I needed to be strong, I was strong. But I had no endurance. I was missing my fifth gear. And like emotionally, like I just had gone through some like really big lows, like 
like I felt like it really kind of like emotionally like destabilized me like a little bit like nothing that I couldn't push through but I really felt like my emotional state changed and like my overall body energy changed you know and like all these different capacities like uh, I wasn't bloated either, you know, I had like really wicked digestion, you know, my, my stomach felt super clean, um, no gas, like no nothing, no acid reflux, nothing along those lines. Now on the vegan diet, the things that I really learned is, um, well, yesterday I go to do my testing, my physical testing. Well, mm -hmm. now my endurance is back up. I have my 50, I'm super happy about that low plank, you know, tons of time you know, static squat, lots of time. Um, I did the battle ropes, totally fine. Felt great, wicked attitude. Couldn't wait to get into like the strength components. I was feeling so good. Exactly the opposite of how I was feeling going into my testing on the carnivore diet. I go put 170 pounds on the bench press because obviously my bench press do 170 pounds. My barbell squats 170, my deadlifts 170, and then chimps. Everything's just the equivalent to my body weight, right? So I go down and, you know, I'm on the bench press. I'm like, yeah, I feel good. I racked that bar off and I was like, holy fuck. I don't even know if I'm going to be able to do one rep. Like oh. I was, I felt that weak. I grabbed this bar and I was like, this isn't good. I, the, the, like it, it was, I, I can't even explain how weak I felt. And like, I was doing like sets of like one, like two, three reps for that two minutes. And like, usually I'm good for about like between about 25 and 30 reps in that two minute time period. Mm -hmm. um, but I was struck. I don't actually don't even know. Like I was, I was having such a tough time with feeling that week. I lost count of how many reps I've done and I haven't gone back and counted it, but I don't even know if I got more than 12 reps in, in that entire two minutes. So then I go from that. I'm like, well, that's, that's deflating, but I'm like, okay, well the barbell back squat will be different because obviously you know, legs, you can push way more weight than you can, you know, doing chest, you know, it's just inevitable way more strain there. So rack up the 170 pounds on the barbell squat. And then I rack the bar off and I go down to like my, my first squat. And I was like, Oh, no, same thing. Like I was just, it felt so heavy. I felt so weak. I'm like this again, like this isn't good. So, you know, again, like cut down about half my reps. The, my chin-ups, however, were like a little bit different. I, I was about this same number um, on my chin-ups. And then on the deadlifts, you know, same thing, just felt like super heavy, felt weak, you know, just, I didn't have the strength. So like, then, so now I kind of realized, okay, well, I can see how my body needs like, you know, like the plants or plant-based nutrition, you know, for that fifth year, that fifth year, I feel like I was missing, um, you know, and then I, I, I know I need the meat, you know, for the strength components. So I, I see the two benefits there. You know, then, you know, when it comes down to like digestion, it's just like, well, on the carnivore diet, you know, I had no gas, no bloating, super easy digestion, um, no acid reflux or nothing. I've never really ever had a heartburn ever. Um, on the vegan diet, I actually realized that I didn't know what acid reflux actually felt like in like heartburn. And I kept asking people, I'm like, this burning feeling right here. I'm like, oh, I'm like, every time I run. And they're like, dude, like that's acid reflux, like heartburn. So I'm like, you had an acid reflux? Tons, okay. almost the entire month. Like every time I ran, um, every time I worked out, like after I ate, I had acid reflux almost every single day that I was on the, um, on the vegan diet, tons of bloating, super uncomfortable. Like I have had more gas this month than I've ever had in my entire life. Um, like I said, like I initially gained 10 pounds, you know, like I was always up about five pounds. Um, my blood pressure was amazing on the carnivore diet. My blood pressure has been terrible on the vegan diet. Um, my internal biological age was, you know, great. Like, it was, like I was below 36 almost the entire time. Um, on the uh, vegan diet, I was above 36 the entire time. Ironically, I ate some meat last night um, for supper. Um, you know, because all my testing had been done, it was the end of this. So I'm like, whatever, I'm gonna have to meet at the end. I wake up this morning and my internal biological age is back down to 39. Not saying that one has anything to do with the other. I just thought it was funny because I eat meat last night and now my internal biological age is, you know, coming back down. Um, you know, and my my cognitive function, you know, like my emotional state wasn't that great when I was on the carnivore diet. Um, and it definitely was way better, like way more enthusiastic being on um, the vegan diet. You know, so I kind of see like that, those like differences there, um, you know, but like, 
I still say like, this is what I would, my, the point that I'm getting at. Like if somebody would have said, these are, this is going to be the result of these two diets or like, these are the symptoms and this is a diet, draw a line to which diet you think caused which one of these symptoms. I would have drawn the carnivore diet to all the symptoms and the data that I have um, accumulated being on the vegan diet. And I would have done the vice versa, you know, for the vegan and the symptoms and like how I felt um, when I was on the carnivore diet It's completely inverted, you know? So, you know, and where people say it's like, well, cause you did the vegan diet after the carnivore diet. And I'm like, well, I'm like, that's not necessarily true because when I was the diet that I was on before going straight carnivore was almost like a plant, like it was like 80% plant-based, 20% meat. So I was way closer to a plant-based vegan diet than I was to a carnivore diet going into this. So that's not relevant to me either. You know, like, so I'm like, I'm like, I have this knowledge. I know what I went in eating. And then, then now it's got into the argument. It's just like, well, you didn't eat plant-based whole food. You know, like with my conversation with, with Orsi that I aired today, I'm like, well, but I don't believe that either because it's not like I was eating wild game meat, which is like the best meat that you can eat. So, you know, like I might not have been eating like whole food, you know, plant-based, organic, everything, but I was eating more processed food on the carnivore diet than what I was on um, the vegan diet because I wasn't eating any processed food really on the vegan diet. I didn't even end up eating the Beyond Meat Burger. You know, but on the carnivore diet, I was eating, you know, bacon, beef jerky, um, you know, sausages, you know, like all pepperoni, like all that crap when I had that bad few days when I was hiking. But I never ate the equivalent to that on the uh, on the plant based diet. My diet on the plant based diet was arguably way better um, than what it was on the carnivore diet. Um, and I had access to a lot more micronutrients, you know, than what I would have being on the carnivore diet. You know, so again, like, like all this data really challenges me to like these concepts and these principles that we've been living on, you know, and this is what I meant by at the beginning of this podcast, where I said, I really value you and your perspective even more now, because now getting into more conversations with people about the results that I've had, like I'm getting in like legit heated arguments with people. And I'm like, you're defending a position that you're not even living. You're defending a position of a documentary that you watched on TV that you're not even living. And now you're challenging me on the results that I've spent a month accumulating when I've slogged this every day to a lot harsher capacity, like testing myself every day, testing myself at the beginning of the month, testing at the end of the month, going through all these protocols, being extremely rigid to make sure that I'm not stepping outside of that and having like you know, an 80, 20 rules during this diet or allowing myself something outside. It's like, no, if I'm carnivore, I'm strictly carnivore. If I'm vegan, I'm strictly vegan. This is the way that it's going to be. And, and I'm like, it, and it's funny. It's made me realize that like people who aren't even in the landscape of nutrition and health, who aren't even living any of these protocols, how we hyper identify with this information that's being put out there, but nobody investigates it, not only for themselves, but it's made me realize the amount of misinformation that's being put out there because, you know, like, like that game changers documentary, it's like you have this one person that says that they, you know, like lift weights and I'm the strongest I've ever been. It's just like, well, yeah, you, you can't pick one person. Like there, there's no arguing that I was benching 170 pounds for about 30 reps in two minutes at the beginning of the month. And at the end of the month, I can barely do 15. Like, like that's real results. You, you cannot argue with that. And my whole point behind this, like, or my whole position during this whole month has been like, I cannot eat enough food to get enough protein. It, like, it's not even possible. Like it, like I, I can't consume that kind of quantity of food. And now I've seen this rapid decline in my strength, but I also see a rapid increase in my performance back to like where I was before. So when you have this guy on the game changers, you know, documentary, oh, I'm doing the battle ropes for an hour. Well, fine. But I did the battle ropes for five minutes plus on my original diet and got bored of doing it. It's the only reason why I stopped. I did the battle ropes for over five minutes on the carnivore diet and stopped because again, I was just bored and didn't care anymore. And I did the battle ropes for over five minutes on the vegan diet and stopped because I just did not care anymore either. So you can't tell me that it's due with that. It's more of just like, 
you're, are you having fun doing what you're doing during a tedious event? Like, that's the only thing to me that I really look at is that, you know, like if I hate those battle ropes every second that I'm doing it, I'm probably not going to be able to do them very long, you know, but if I'm going to enjoy what I'm doing and looking around and having a good day and kind of just like absorbing the environment and bring myself outside of the ropes, like a meditation with inside of physical activity, being like, don't count the reps, don't count the time, just do the ropes and just be lost in it. Go to have some fun. You can do it forever. Like you, you could do it for as long as you really wanted to. But what you can't do, if you can't bench press 170 pounds, you can't fake that shit. You either can lift that weight or you can't. It doesn't matter what kind of meditation you do before or you lose yourself into it. Either you are strong enough to lift the weight or you are not. It is as black and white as that. Right. You're right. And I'm, I'm interested that your result in the first and second, how is it? Like people never expect that answer. Like, what? Yeah, like I we, wouldn't either. Yeah, but I think also another thing that I, I just to keep on thinking, it's a possible because you've been on carnivore diet for 30 days. And that's, in a way, it's a simple diet. Mm -hmm. You just go for the uh, animal meat. Yeah. Right? And then you add the fat, right? It's the, all the saturated fat. So you had organ meat as well. You had also regular, all those. But it was a good source as well, right? The organic grass-fed beef. And then you had some fish. You had shellfish. You had tons of oyster. And yes, you get the protein and fat, you know, like there's no fiber. But because your body, a certain way also is adapted very quickly. Mm -hmm. And then after that, when break that kind of diet, number one, you go for the plant-based diet. Yes, there is a phytonutrients in it. Yes, there is a tons of fibers in it. But the body is like your body is like your immune cell is at a certain point, like a kind of used to it, that simple material mm -hmm. that you provide. And now... You're moving to the a lot more complicated different colors of vegetable that's different vitamins and minerals, different phytonutrients in it, and plus you get tons of fiber. The your body immune they start to they are waking up. They have to react to all those things. So yeah. I get it when you say I get more bloated. Yeah, of course. Yeah. The fiber makes you feel bloated. Number one, so you get bloated, and your body has to also adjust that time, right? And then acid reflex. Uh, what did you do when you have that? Did you have some apple cider vinegar? Uh, no, like I didn't because like, I know it's not, but I, I'm trying not to even substitute things like apple cider vinegar in, into my day because like, to me, that kind of classifies more into a supplement. Um, like I know it's technically not, but I'm like, I'm treating it as in like, you know, I wouldn't take apple cider vinegar when I was like on like the carnivore diet or like, I wouldn't take the equivalent to that. Like, a but it's a vegan is apple cider vinegar <laughs> yeah you know if that, if that's what I mean you know but like I tried to look at that in less of it something like I don't want to take like a pill a liquid you know anything along those lines because they're all kind of like slippery slopes right like you know if I can justify taking you know apple cider vinegar I could justify taking ginseng you know then if I'm taking like ginseng like I could justify taking like this next thing and like you know so like, where does that stop? And then I'm like, well, I might as well just take a multivitamin too, because the multivitamin is vegan, you know, so I could take a multivitamin as well. But like, so that's why I kind of try to curb those things, like as mm -hmm. much as I can, just saying like, well, I'm not going to try to help this. I'm going to take just like the food itself and say, okay, like, what is just this food doing outside of anything that might help me digest that food more or might help stack the cards in that favor. It's more just like, this is the food, this qualifies as like a vegan meal. I'm going to eat this vegan meal only because this falls within the category, right? It's very hard because when you uh, have acid reflex, that means your stomach acid level is not balanced, right? Mm. It has to be very acidic so you can break down all those food. So yeah. when you have an acid reflex, it's coming from your intestine. That yeah. means that there is somewhere along your intestine there, your vegetable is uh, fermented in the wrong place. Yeah. You got stuck. That's why you get bloated, you get like a gassy, and then you get acid reflex. That's how it happened. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, for me, it's like when you tell and, me, it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And see, and like Ariel's perspective on, on top of that, too, is that like, you know, because um, meat is going to take more acid to be able to break down, my body produced more stomach acid during like eating, like, you know, like on the carnivore diet to be able to digest all the meat that I was eating. So, the volume of the stomach acid inside my stomach 
potentially had increased as well you know, and then I don't need all that stomach acid, you know, like when I'm eating like a plant based diet, so then I kind of have this over concentration, which I also get that it's a it's a valid point to be able to make too. my point that I bring back in is that the it never decreased, if anything, it increased by through the course of the month, it didn't decrease. So like, I could see all of these things like your point and her point and Orsi's point happening maybe for the first we'll call it two weeks. But mm -hmm. then I should have seen a time when all those things started to get better, you mm -hmm. know, because my microbiome would have changed, you know, like, like, you know, my immune system would have changed, like all these things would have changed to be able to shift, you know, to eating this new diet. But actually what happened is all of them got worse. My, my acid reflux got worse. My gas got worse. The bloating got worse. The inflammation got worse. Uh, my blood pressure got worse. My internal biological age got worse. You know, my weight never really did ever come down or stabilize back down into like the sub 170s. It always was above like 170 pounds, depending on like the odd day. Like, like all these things never actually got better. Now, the flip side argument to that on the carnivore diet is that I initially was doing like very well, but then I kind of hit this edge and kind of fell off a little bit like towards the end. When I said about three weeks in, I started having all these cravings, you know, so like you see the deficiency there. The problem is that on the, on the vegan diet, the plant-based diet is those things never got better. They got worse as well. So like you see both of like that spread getting larger. And like what I said at the beginning of this, the scary part to me is on a carnivore diet, I could see based on how I felt, I would want to initiate change. Like it was apparent enough to me and I would believe the average person would too. Now on the vegan diet, the changes, the negative components that I was seeing, I feel are symptoms that people are living with every day that they just think are normal. Like that's just become a normal everyday part of life. They don't really see the necessity and be able to change that. And nobody's regularly taking, you know, like their metabolic age, their internal biological age, their mm -hmm. weight regularly, their blood pressure regularly like I was. Mm -hmm to notice those things changing for the worse. So the, those to me are like the silent components where people just kind of go about their life and all of a sudden five years later, they're just like, what do you mean I have hypertension? What do you mean I have type two diabetes? What do you mean I have to start taking the statin to be able to lower my blood pressure? Like I'm healthy, I, I'm, I'm predominantly plant-based or I'm vegan. Like, you know, like, like I, I see these playing out and how this kind of creeps in, you know, not saying that the carnivore diet didn't have its defects too. Like I'm, I'm very, like avid is saying that there's detriments to the carnivore diet too but again the detriments to the carnivore diet made me want to change it but the detriments on the vegan diet i could see how they would go unchecked because they don't seem like that big of a deal i just know they are based on how i know my body felt but then again i was also getting the data that was coming along with it that's it. And also, I think because the uh, carbohydrate, mostly is carbohydrate, right? The fiber is carbohydrate. That's a um, vegan diet. When you go through that, like uh, now I'm really focusing on your gut health because you had like 30 days. So I really 100% agree that, like, yeah, no wonder you couldn't even lose weight. Yeah. Because if you cannot metabolize, you know, you have like gut health, you know, how are you going to lose weight? Because yeah. your body is not absorbing nutrient neither. Yeah. And plus, remember, like, it got also produced the gut hormones, right? Yeah. And then those gut hormones is like, uh, they, um, they stimulate your pancreas. They stimulate some other, you know, uh, the organ and glands. And so what happens is that it produces more insulin. And yeah. also it metabolizes your glucose, right? So if, uh, when, I, when I hear from what you say, like, I still think, like, uh, probably it's all the, for me, like, uh, Vegan diet, like we say, there's not enough the protein. And yeah. then when you balance your protein, you have to increase your fat and also your carbohydrate content as well. And those special carbohydrate, the end, it turn glucose. Yeah. So when your glucose is so much flowing around in your gut, there's no way, first of all, you're going to lose weight. It's very hard to metabolize everything. You're actually hard to manipulate your blood sugar level. So I'm sure you're going to like... Uh, I don't want to say like keep on going back and forth. You're going to have more craving yeah. and then you want to eat more often because you don't feel really, um, you don't feel satiated when you eat that. No. Right. So it's, it's kind of, the puzzle is uh, coming together. That's what I see at the end of the day. 
Yeah. See, and you make a you make a really good point, and I'm glad that you brought that up because I think it's a really key point to bring this because, like, I have brought this up numerous times, but again, what we're talking right now is like direct comparisons and you know, kind of between these two diets and you know breaking it down, and that is something that I think. On the vegan diet, like I would be so full, I would feel disgusting. Like, like my stomach would be bloated, food up to here, acid reflux, and I would walk by something and I'm like, well, I'll have a bite of that. It's like I see how people can like overeat and overconsume, you know, on, and I'm not, and I say this in regards to vegan too, but my point behind this is, is in a, a predominantly carbohydrate dominant diet because that's what essentially the vegan diet is. So like, you know, I'm not saying that like, you know, you know, if people are eating meat, but they have a predominantly carbohydrate diet, I really see how overeating becomes extremely relevant because last night for supper, you know, having a, like a bunch of meat with it, I was full, but I'm like, I easily walked away from eating. Mm -hmm. But I do know the previous like, like 30 days before that, feeling as full as I was, I would have went and ate more. I, I know that not because I wanted to, but I had more signaling. My intuition was telling, it was telling me more to eat more than it was telling me to walk away. Last night, my intuition was telling me to walk away than it was to be able to eat more. And on the carnivore diet, my intuition didn't even come into play because when you were done eating, the satiation level was like, like a hundred percent every single time. And you didn't even entertain eating more food after at all. That's a really good point because uh, carbohydrate-based diet to uh, plant-based diet. So that's why that's the problem. When you stick to only um, vegan source, what happened? Like it's really in, it, it stimulates your stomach. So it's like a, those um, hunger hormone, the leptin yeah. hormone, and uh, gradient hormone produced. So like you you crave something because you go into your neurotransmitters. So like uh, you like uh, you full, but like uh, you feel like. Uh, you got to eat something where you can have it. Also, you crave for something. You want to munch something. So yeah. that's what you went through, right? The yeah. past 30 days. Yeah, that's why. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, know I never like, fanned for like, I never going to be turned out uh, vegan. You know, like I never done even. Like I can't. <laughs> See, and, and, this is, and this is my, this, this, this is why, like if somebody asked me in my honest opinion right now, not going through the ketogenic diet or, you know, like paleo, like I, I think once they start dabbling into like a little bit more like, the paleo diet and like those ones, it becomes a little bit more like watered down, you know, because I, I find like the real evidence, the real key points are going to be the difference between like a, a protein rich diet carnivore, you know, a carbohydrate rich vegan and a fat rich, um, like ketogenic, ketogenic. Like that's going to be like the real three diets. There are three months to be able to focus on the rest of it is kind of like just different diet trends. Yeah. You know, but like what I, what I pulled away from the first two months is this is my selling case that yes, we overeat and yes, we overeat meat. But what I think, you know, like if we, you still absolutely need meat in your diet. Do we need meat at the level that like what a carnivore diet would, would consume? No. Um, but do we need the carbohydrates that like what a vegan diet um, accumulates? We don't need that either. This is like my selling case, like at all, like the, you need meat sources to feel satiated. Like for people to tell me now that you can get satiated off the protein that you're finding, like in vegan meals when it's predominantly carbohydrate based, I think they're full of shit. That's not the same. That's an uh, incomplete uh, protein. Yeah. It's not the same. Body yeah. converts different way. Yeah. So it's not the same. Yeah. So it's too different, and then that's why you have to have a little bit, you know. And then everybody's different. Some people maybe have more. Let's let's say you and I like more like a twenty and eighty. Yeah, the twenty is a protein, and eighty is like a plant based. But some people work well fifty fifty. Is everybody's different? So yeah. you have to find what works for you. That's most important. And I never believe in like one diet. Because you, it's not sustained. You can't because uh, that's going to actually trigger your emotionally, the brain as well. So like you, people tend to have a uh, uh, eating disorder at the end because when you restrict one thing, because uh, the body and brain, we don't design that way. So you have to you know, go for something else. So when you more restrict, you want to have things. So yeah. when you went through a uh, kind of a diet, I'm sure, I don't know. I, I never ask you, tell me truth. Yeah. 
Tell me. I like where this is going. You just made me feel <laughs> nervous. I'm just like, I'm like, oh, like, where are we going with this? You're like, ah. Tell me truth. You want to know my YouTube search history? <laughs> <laughs> kind of a diet and plant-based diet when you did it. You ever had the one meal or one single just to touch, like uh, get out of your diet or you just stick to that? Stick to that. Wow. I would say the carnivore diet. Well, so actually, no, no, no. Now that you say that, that's actually not even true. Um, I can give you an example in both and both of them were not conscious. So on the carnivore diet, um, one time I had butter and then I'm like, I just don't agree with this. So I stopped. I'm like, you know, and I know, but you're allowed to eat butter on a carnivore diet. But I'm like, again, this is the slippery slope. You know, it's like the, um, the apple cider vinegar, um, you know, citrus. So like the butter to me was the gateway to milk, cheese, cottage cheese, sour cream, all this yogurt, all this other stuff. Right? It's sugar. Yeah. It's a carbohydrate. Yeah. Right. So I'm just like, no butter's off, you know? Mm-hmm. So I'm like, to me, that was like oversight. But other than that, no, not at all. Um, when I was on at the very beginning of the month on the vegan diet, um, I got um, a bunch of uh, vegan Indian food. Well, what I told was vegan Indian food. And I should have known, but there's this one dish that I like never tried before. And I was like, hey, what's in it? And they're like, it's a tofu dish. And I'm like, okay, I was eating it. Ah. So I had like two or three pieces of this tofu, um, but it actually turned out to be paneer. Oh, so I was just like, so I was like, shit. So, you know, but like once I, but it wasn't a conscious to like, I didn't do it like intentionally. Like it was completely like, and, and like, so I, that, that's it. That would be like my only, um, those that would be like my one on both of those scales, um, where there was like an incident that happened. One was a conscious choice. I, I consciously ate the butter because it's allowed on the cover of diet, but I, I just chose not to because it seemed hypocritical. Um, you know, and then on the vegan diet, like I was actually told it was something that it wasn't, but once I realized what it was, then I stopped eating it. And, um, yeah, no, cause I, like, I just, like, I find you, you have no authority of authenticity to be able to stand on and speak about something. If you're going to allow for exceptions, because it skews the data, the data is already going to be skewed enough already as it is anyway, because I don't live the same life every day. That's like right. that's going to skew the data considerably already anyway so the things that i can absolutely control are these things because the one thing i realized between the two diets i can't control quantity and i'm not going to because i never put quantity restrictions on to begin with and my my goal was is what does this diet do to you naturally you know like with the carnivore diet you would feel full and satiated so you wouldn't eat anymore the vegan diet you wouldn't so i just was like how does my body feel i'm going to go with what my body's telling me to do you know, so like, like, I really just try to keep everything very like open to that diet. And like, does this diet give me enough nutrients? What are the struggles? And you know, like, I want to be able to control all the components that I can. If I start, you know, allowing for slight deviations, where does that stop? Right? Like, and again, like, I want to be able to speak to these things, like with like, with authority and authenticity, because like, I did choose to be that rigid in the things that I can control. Um, because I realize I think the necessity now where I go with this is going to some like nutritional seminars where there would be people like us mm-hmm. like speaking and saying like, look, I know you guys want to believe all this, but you have to entertain this other information now too. Like I've lived this. I know what it's like. Like this is real. Like these results and these statistics are real. Here's the data that, you know, that supports that. Right. And, uh, you know, and again, like I did, like I would rather be able to posture that position than to say, you know, like, well, I had these meals or, or like every Sunday night, I, you know, I took it off and did this because like, I just, I know too much and knowing that that one meal or that one day doesn't, it doesn't stop there because the trickle down effect of that last days, if not weeks in your body, you know, like if I, if I was on a, a, a vegan diet and I had one steak, well, the benefit to that steak in my body is going to last, you know, for like six to 10 days, you know, so it it doesn't end with just that one steak at that one time It's going to directly affect the amino acid levels in my body for well over a week after that. So like it just really skews the information. So I tried to really stay focused on on not breaking that pattern. 
usually, uh, let's say you have uh, one steak for entire 30 days. It's, it's not going to really um, affect a lot, but still it's going to, but more is going to affect your brain mm -hmm. emotionally. So what happened once you, you introduce that one and your brain going to say, hey, Blake, yeah. you know, this is, a, this is the reason why, you know, you need to have a steak again. So you start to, you know, like your brain convince you to have another steak down the road. What I'm telling you is that restricting one thing, especially comes with the diet. Yeah. Like we don't want to get restricted. Our brain, we don't want to get restricted. So that's why I'm asking you, did you ever have it? Like, you know, since it's cheating, right? So if yeah. you cheat once, it's going to actually manifest. The second and third, you want to keep on doing that. So you're going to fight with yourself entire 30 days. Yeah. It's tough because what I'm telling you out there, there's so many people, they're living that life. Mm -hmm. They try to look for the something magical, like a good diet for their body so they can get results. And then they just to stay in that diet. They don't even understand their body. And yep. they stick to that diet because somebody said, wow, you should go for this diet. You're going to get results, blah, blah, blah. They do it. When that happened, no, you can't stick to diet because you have a right now mission because you want to prove the pure data. This is what happened when you go on this one. But people, regular people, they go on diet because they are doing for themselves. They yeah. don't have the public that for out there to showing something proof. So always there is the, the brain say, okay, yeah, listen, Blake, you got to have this because now you're having this, you know, all oh, life happens. So now you have to have this. They give all kinds of excuses to have something else that not belong in that diet. So what I'm saying the end, you can't just create a diet, one diet blueprint and then uh, share with everyone. Yeah. That's like, you know, like uh, you're going to fail eventually. Yeah. So People have to understand right now, if they tune your podcast, they're going to understand that it's like a, it's because kind of a diet work really well with you. It's not going to work with them. I'm telling you now, because the first of all, it's freaking expensive oh, and yeah. it, is, it is expensive. And if you're going to go for the conventional meats and those things, you better not to do it because of all those chemicals, how are you going to actually remove that? Yeah. So actually it's bad for you. And then second, it's a missing, it's a good nutrient wise, it's a, it's a missing, one part is missing. Your body is designed to have all essential nutrients. So eventually when you restrict like that, you're going to actually even like a suffer. Mm -hmm. You're going to have all kinds of craving. And how are you going to sustain that diet? How are you going to create a lifestyle with it? It's impossible. So because of, oh, Blake is doing so well, so I'm going to do it. They're all hyped and they do it. Eventually they're going to just fail. Yes. Yeah. So, Eventually, they have to find on their diet. And, but you prove a really good thing. So I'm very curious because in my stuff, I did a many diet. My longest diet I did was 26 weeks. Yeah. It, it's tough. And it's a mental case. And one point, I tell you my story a little bit, uh, not too long. Um, when I start my fitness journey, uh, it's all about the, how I look. Yeah. And I want to win the show. Yeah. So I did a crazy diet. And so now I know it's a good, oh, it was a mild nutrient. So I did those kind of that. I was ripped. I was shredded. I was a six pack. The guy's like, oh my gosh, she's pilled. Yeah. That much I did diet. You know, after that, I was getting into, when I finished the show, I thought that I'm getting into eating disorder. Yeah. My brain was going nuts. I could eat entire fridge. It's not because I'm hungry. Yeah. So when you deprive for a prolonged period after, you know, the, the side effect you're getting it is, is incredible. And some people, they're never going to recover. Yeah. So they shouldn't do like really one single diet and then, you know, like a fight with the diet and never do that. So you doing right now is amazing because you go with, you don't strict the portion. You just go with the flow and plus you know your body. So therefore, you know what, you don't get really effective with doing the kind of a diet or plant-based diet, even ketogenic diet, even better because you're going to get results, right? And you already done before, right? Mm. So which is good. And I, I think you should do like a vegan version of a ketogenic diet. People yeah. People demand yeah. for that. People demand for that. Yeah. See, and, and like, you know, like you bring up like a, like a, a point that I, I want to touch on too is that like I'm doing this to hopefully 
stop people from doing these heavily lopsided diets, not to encourage people that one of them is good. Like my, my goal is to show people that like, I can exacerbate the long-term detriment of these diets extremely fast because of what my lifestyle is and how I choose to be able to live my life. I can exacerbate those very quickly, you know, and I, I don't ever want anybody to think that a carnivore diet is good or a vegan diet is good or anything like that, because yes, we do need balance and that you never should be on one diet for the rest of your life. You know, I should be on one specific way of eating. You know, like you're going to eat differently in the summer than you are in the winter time. Like, you know, like seasonal eating comes into it. Like there's going to be changes to it. The key thing is like what we always keep coming back to is the cut out the sugars, the processed shit, get away from the McDonald's trips, you know, like don't be heavily lopsided in one category. Don't flip flop diets. Don't look for the one diet that's going to be the be all end all. You just need to stay consistent, you know, because my health has been worse the last two months than what it has probably been in the last 10 years because I slowly took an extremely long period of time to be like, get to this place of optimal health of where I was two months ago. And then I specifically stabbed my own tires and let the wheels come off the bus, you know? So it's like, that's what I want people to take away from it is because, and again, it's the reason why I've made these, these 90 degree turns and dies because that's what people do. Like they wake up one day and it's like, I'm going to fast and go on a juice diet. Wake up one day, I'm going to be vegan. I'm going to wake up one day, I'm going to be carnivore. Because like, this is what a heater is the best idea. And I'm like, I'm so sick and tired of like people in our positions propagating that these, these are good decisions. You know, like all the trainers that like, you know, like that say, oh, come lose 20 pounds in the next 10 days. I want to like soccer kick them in the face. It is such, it's so irresponsible. And I was just hoping after all of these years and decades that we'd get past that. You know, but the one thing I noticed, and this is the commonality behind it, it's there's two things I've realized with the people in that environment. It's either the young people getting into this industry who don't really know enough yet. And now they have too big of a voice because they have social media and all that stuff to be able to pump out like this message that they want to say. Um, like, and, or it's just the people who continually stay in the lane of being misinformed and not actually like experimenting with themselves and like reading both sides of it and like really understanding like what this all means. Because 15 years ago when they read this thing or did this thing that may work for them, they've never got outside of that perspective or component at all. And they not only stick themselves there, but then they stick everybody that they quote unquote educate or quote unquote guide in that same category. And this is why I think a lot of people continually search for that one thing is because people want to tell others that they have the answer. They have something that works. And it's a lot sexier for somebody to say to lose, I'll, I'll lose you 20 pounds in the next 10 days versus somebody who says, let's take the next five years to figure this out. Exactly. So it's all come down to lifestyle. And number one is like a, along the way, you really, one thing you have to focus on, just try to understand your body. Yeah. Body tells you, they communicate with you. They're yeah. showing the symptoms. And even though your thought that that's like communicating with you, why are you craving especially that food? Yeah. Like you investigate why your body is like that. Instead of listening to some chicks, you know, the uh, uh, Instagram talk about, oh, you know what? I'm going to give you the six pack. It's her thing. It's not you. So yeah. that's people have to adapt it, so, which is really good. And I'm very exciting about your ketogenic diet because um, I was thinking like he may gonna go for a ketogenic diet next yeah. one because that's most like uh, the fat. Yeah. We talk about it. it's a fat diet, right? So you're going yeah. for it. It's excellent. And then. And it's a complete shift, right? Like it, it, it's, a, it's a complete shift from like, you know, now I've got, I was vegan and now I'm going to be eating meat again. You know, I was probably eating carbohydrates, now I'm eating fat. And so like the one before that, well, you know, I was probably eating like protein and meat. And then I went to, you know, like plant-based and carbohydrates. And, you know, now I'm fat-based and a more of a blend, you know? So like, it'll be interesting to see like what happens in all the numbers this month for sure. Because with these 90 degree turns, you know, in diet and stuff, right? Is it possible? Can you show to people three different ways to measure your ketone level, like urine? Yeah. And then you can do like a breath. 
ketone yeah. and then you can do a blood, right? Because I know blood testing is very, very accurate. I did that too. I have that machine too at home. And then I also do like a urine test too. That's, uh, you know, beginning people start, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's good, it's cheap, you know, it's not expensive. The people can use that. It's, sometimes it's not really accurate. You have to do multiple times to find, the, you know, your number. But if you show three different things that people kind of get educated, yeah. Oh, this is what it does. You know, this is a good pros and cons. You know, you can actually show to people. Maybe so, what I'll do is like, like, um, because I'm going to predominantly use like the, the breath test. I do have the, the blood, um, breaker coming. I'm going to be mm-hmm. here in about a week. Um, and stuff. And like, I'll get some of the urine testing chips just cause they're cheap, but maybe what I'll do is I'll predominantly use the, the breath meter, um, like for like the daily readings. And then like once a week, at the same time, I'll do the urine test, the breath test, and the blood test to show what the different numbers are because all three of those numbers I know are going to be different. Um, so I just kind of show the variability between all of those. Because I do know that some people would pee on the strips and they'd be like in a 2.5. And they're like, oh, I need to go like, you know, deeper into ketosis. Or they they kind of just be like in a real like, you know, kind of minor range. But then all of a sudden they would do like the uh, blood test and they would be like in the fives, you know? So like you're kind of teetering on the brink of like, you know, ketoacidosis and stuff. Right. So like, like I, like I've always thought that that is valuable information to be able to put out there because like one, you want to push harder and two, you want to bump yourself back, you know? So like, you know, if you stay too high up in that like five, six, seven range, you know, like you're going to go to the doctor, you know, pretty soon or like you should be entertaining it, you know? So it's like, you know, you kind of look at like those, you know, like, most different perspectives. I think it'd be valuable to do that, you know, maybe like once every five days or something like that. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Just to be able to kind of have like that, like triple comparison uh, mm-hmm. between the two. And then I'll stick with like the, the breath test monitor um, strictly a little bit more of the mm-hmm. convenience and stuff like that uh, for the majority of just the daily readings in the morning. What is going to be your um, carbohydrate uh, during ketogenic diet? I don't really know yet just because like the carbohydrates are just going to be so and like, you know, to me, I've committed about like the next like three or four days just to really like drawing that down, like as low as possible. Um, like, like next to no carbohydrates, just to make sure that like, I'm, you know, because with the, with the vegan diet and with the carnivore diet, the day that I woke up that day, I was carnivore and that day I was vegan, although I had some nutrients left over in my system from before. Mm-hmm. But the one thing that I can't do is like, I can't wake up one morning or like this morning and all of a sudden I'm in like a three to four range in ketosis. Like I would have had to start that process a couple of days before. So I just want to try to get into that level of ketosis as quick as I can and then maintain that and then kind of like play around with like, you know, like what I'm going to do for carbohydrates or like what that's going to look like or how much I can have or, you know, like all that kind of stuff. Because I know my carbohydrate level like can dramatically like increase and decrease you know, because of like, you know, like obviously I regularly, you know, intake like large amounts of cinnamon, which helps regulate my blood sugar levels. You know, like I regularly like, you know, trail run, you know, 10, 15 kilometers, you know, like I lift weights. I do, I like, I rode bike. I do all these different things that, you know, I can adjust my carbohydrate level um, Mm -hmm. daily and still stay in that level of ketosis, you know, based on like, like my activity level. So like I said, I'm just going to kind of get through this weekend and then kind of see, you know, do like fasting, do fasting, fasting is the fastest yeah. way you can get into ketosis. The yeah. fasting is number one. Yeah. 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 And you know what? One point at the end, if you want, you should do like um, uh, five days fasting. Yeah. Well, that's actually what I want to do. Um, like as, as another month is I want to go like on a fasting like diet, mm-hmm. like whether that's like a one day fast, a three day refeed or that I want to find some kind of like protocol to follow that incorporates fasting into like one of these you should do fasting because the fasting is so many health benefits at the same time um fasting is that uh people they don't know how to get in fast and especially like how to break the fast break the fast is a lot more important but one point when you start doing fasting and you know exactly for your body how you break your fast so yeah. people they don't know those things and then you if you never done like more than five days fasting oh you want to try once in your life. Yeah, I know. I want to. Oh, uh, sure. that feeling, like, uh, you cannot buy. Really, you cannot buy. The yeah. Amazing. One day, just flip, you wake up and go, holy shit. Like, your energy is from the bottom to, like, uh, on the top of yeah. the mountain. It changed, and then 
you, everything changed. Your skin changed, your, your vision changed, everything changed. Yeah. The, how the body can do with the fasting, I think you should do that one day. It's really oh, good. Yeah, I totally, oh. yeah, it's on the, it's on the, the to-do <laughs> list with everything else and stuff, but. Yeah, because that's where you tap into, you know, the, your cell is eating the dead cell, right? So yeah. you want to get into that, you know, for the, your longevity as well, but you're going to see everything change. Yeah. Your appearance changes, so you should do that as well. Awesome. So, interesting. So it's a good chat. So what's your day today? What are you going to do? Um, I got a few me like I just I did a podcast this morning doing this one now. Um, I actually it's good that we're kind of wrapping things up right now because I got a, a meeting downtown that I got to go to. Um, and then I have a few more meetings this afternoon. So like, like nothing, uh, nothing too crazy. Just just a, a heavy meeting day. I don't know why it worked out to be that way but it just kind of i know maybe because everybody thought it was supposed to be raining today but it looks nice outside it's right beautiful now. i'm gonna get out i'm gonna go train in the clinic yeah, yeah. good good all right okay, well have fun doing that and, and we'll chat soon okay good have a good day blake okay, have a wonderful day bye